However, I, well, I'm going to begin with the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians because I think there is one crucial issue in Christology today that overshadows all the rest, and that is the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I remember about 20 years ago when I was lecturing at one of our Southern Baptist seminaries that I got the surprise of my life. I had uh, lectured on the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians about how that he died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried. On the third day he was raised according to the scriptures. And then comes the great passage, perhaps the oldest passage about the appearances of Jesus in all the Bible, older than the Gospels even, when he says he appeared to Cephas, that is Simon Peter, and then he appeared to the twelve apostles, which of course uh, is recorded in the Gospels. Then he appeared about 500 people all at one time, and most of them were still alive when Paul was writing, and by that he simply meant, if you don't believe it, most of them are alive and you can consult them. Well, that is known as the appearances that laid the foundation for the church. It often, Harnock many years ago called these the church founding, uh, these appearances of church founding significance. And then the church mission starts with James and he appeared to James, his brother, who did not believe that his older brother was the Messiah until he appeared to him, a very interesting thing in itself. In other words, James would have not been the great leader of the Jerusalem church had he not come for some reason to believe that the one who was born of Mary before he was was the Messiah, and God had raised him from the dead, and he believed that because it is said he appeared to James. And that is the beginning of the mission of the church. And then he said to all the apostles. You see, there are many more apostles than the twelve, as we learn by reading the New Testament, particularly the Acts of the Apostles, where Barnabas himself is called an apostle. But then last of all, and this is the most significant thing for Paul, last of all, about six or seven years later, he appeared to Paul. And he says, I was like a child that's untimely born. About year 36, as we calculate it, he appeared to Paul. Now, it's very interesting. Three people, Cephas, and then uh, after Cephas, James, and then last of all, Paul. Three of the founders of Christianity, three of the great apostles, all attribute their apostleship to the fact that they saw the Lord when he was raised from the dead. Now then, when I had given a lecture like this about 20 years ago and attended the faculty club in the evening, I found myself under siege. I was ambushed by about five or six professors in that seminary who had studied with Rudolf Bultmann or some of his disciples. And I remember they surrounded me just like uh, barking dogs, and they wanted to give me a real quiz. Well, I can fight pretty well, but six at a time is a little uh, difficult, but I shall never forget that evening. I remember one of them, who had actually been a former student of mine, looked at me with great Bultmann learning and said, do you really believe that Jesus Christ arose somaticosly? Took the word soma, you see, and made an adverb out of it, that he arose somaticosly? And I said, I believe that Jesus arose somaticosly, but I don't believe he was raised sarkicosly. <laughs> well, we got into a discussion. You see, that's exactly what Paul says in that chapter that it's not the socks that he's raised, but the soma. And if you miss that, you miss the clue to the greatest chapter in the Bible about the resurrection. You see, the point of that is Rudolf Bultmann in 1941 had published his famous essay called The New Testament and Mythology, and had come to the conclusion that all the things that happen after the crucifixion are myths created out of the sh shock of the crucifixion and uh, therefore they imagined these wonderful things happened. They couldn't take it that Jesus was dead. So they told the stories about an empty tomb and about appearances and so forth. And that was uh, what was set forth in that historic document from the point of view of the discussion of Christology, New Testament and mythology. And everything was supposed to be myth after the cross. Matter of fact, the Rudolf Bultmann's, Rudolf Bultmann's view of Jesus was about three solid facts in history. One is John the Baptist baptizing. Second was that he preached in Galilee. And the third was he got nailed on a Roman cross. 
it got down, particularly in his book called Jesus, all, as far as facts were concerned, that was about it, about three different facts. So naturally, the whole question was raised. And how did all of these stories arise? And of course, they rose as mythology. It's what I call Rorschach religion. Uh, under the shock of the crucifixion, they created all of these things like we do when we look at ink blots. And they had these beautiful stories about appearances in Galilee, appearances in Jerusalem. So I got a real working over that night. Well, I want to say at the very beginning tonight, and you can buckle your seat belts if you don't agree, uh, that I still believe Jesus Christ arose somewhat coastly. I don't think the empty tomb was an invention, but the most important thing, as many have emphasized recently, are the appearances. Lothar Tonnenberg, whose theology has been digested by one of my former students and now my colleague, Frank Tupper, has based his whole theology, or Christology, one of the great works published in the last generation, Jesus Christ, God and man. And uh, he bases everything upon the belief that not only is the resurrection historical, but the appearances are real appearances. I don't think that's the only thing we have uh, to base the belief on the resurrection about. I think still the empty tomb has to be explained because if Jesus' corpse was in the tomb, they could have very easily disproven all these wild stories that they claim took place by just producing a corpse. It's interesting that Rudolf Bultmann always talks about the resurrection as a resuscitation of a corpse. Well, I don't believe that. I believe when Jesus rose from the dead, you didn't have to roll the rock back for him to get out. They rolled the rock back so that people could find out he's not here. He's risen. Well, uh, but you see, you can pummel us with that. You see, as late as 1900 and, well, when was it, 76, when Jeffrey Lamp gave the famous Bampton Lectures in Oxford, he took very much the same view in England. His in his book, uh, God as Spirit. Oh, yes, the Spirit worked in the prophets. The Spirit worked in Jesus. Spirit continues to work in the church, and there are many brilliant insights in his Bampton Lectures. But the only thing that really lives on is the Spirit of God, Old Testament, Jesus, and the church. And so he does exactly the same thing as he talks about the resurrection. He always says physical body. The very point of the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is it was not a Sukikos body. It was a Numenikos body. How can anyone read one time and fail to get it? There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And even with us in the resurrection, which I'll talk about in the fourth lecture to some extent, even us, it is not the physical body that is raised, but it is the spiritual body that is raised. And it was, of course, because of the belief about Jesus that his physical body was transformed and transmuted into an eschatological, glorified, immortal, imperishable body, according to the language of the Apostle Paul. Well, there we are, you see, all the way from Rudolf Bultmann to Jeffrey Lamp. You could make it look real silly. Well, I know that the Apostles' Creed has read two ways during the centuries. Uh, some of them said resurrection of flesh. See, the old way, I believe in the resurrection of the dead, they said in the early church. What do you mean by the dead? Well, you know that some forms of the Apostles' Creed said flesh. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe in the resurrection of flesh, and neither did the Apostle Paul. He said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. said only a fool believes that. Now, I'm quoting Scripture in case you don't know it. Some will say, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they have? And he said, thou fool. If I said that, you'd be offended, but I'm just quoting Scripture, remember. <laughs> well, so there is the first mistake they made. It's interesting, though, to come across people that I think are just as intelligent. I don't know of a better, of a man better informed in modern scientific methodology than Wolfhard Pannenberg. And here he comes and builds his whole Christology upon the belief that God raised Jesus from the dead and that if you follow him, he'll someday raise you from the dead. And what happened to him will happen to you. It's interesting that the two German theologians that I feel closest to today both hold to the historicity of the resurrection. So I want to say to begin with, it's not just a benighted Southern Baptist talking on this subject tonight, but I have some pretty good friends. Perhaps a theologian that I agree with more than any other German theologian is Jürgen Moltmann, whose explosive theology focused on eschatology, not Christology, but on eschatology takes the other end of the pole. 
Uh, Wolfhart Tonnenberg talks about he raised Jesus. And Moltmann's always talking about the great apocalypse when he's going to raise us. And I could tell you some interesting stories along that line. I think I'll just begin by doing so. <laughs> when he wrote his first book, I was jubilant. Uh, it was published the first year that my book was published on the same subject. But people heard of his more than did mine. 1964, I wrote a review of it, and I said, Great, here's one who is building an eschatology upon the resurrection of Jesus, exactly what he does. And I said, What he needs is a doctrine of the cross. Well, five years later, he came out with a book called The Crucified God. said when Jesus died on the cross, he was a God-forsaken man who died for God-forsaken sinners. I said, Hallelujah, let me get to class as quick as I can and, and, and quote this. And didn't. I had my students all upset because they were absolutely perturbed about the belief that when Jesus died on the cross, he died a God-forsaken death. Matter of fact, they nearly had a nervous breakdown when I preached the chapel service on, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But if you don't believe that's what happened on the cross, you're not taking Mark and Matthew seriously. Anyway, there it was. Well, I read that book and I said, now what he needs is a doctrine of the Spirit. Five years later, he came out with the church and the power of the Spirit. It's pretty interesting, too. He, he had a manuscript on ecclesiology that I talked about last night. When he read my two reviews, he decided to add a, ch a chapter. The chapter is called The Church and the Power of the Spirit, which was the title he used for the entire book. Well, I was having a good time at that time because three theses, doctoral th dissertations, I had, I had uh, supervised on his theology. Then I said, well, now what he needs to do is put all this together and have a doctrine of the Trinity. I've stopped talking now. The greatest book on the Trinity that's ever been written has been published recently by the same man, Jürgen Moltmann, called The Trinity and the Kingdom of God. I wanted to start out with that. I wasn't planning to begin with, but it just came to me. Now, that ought to say one thing, that a lot of our, well, this was a Southern Baptist seminary where they ambushed me. They were drunk on Boatman beer. Everything intoxicated they were. Everything was an hallucination. I even have a colleague now who won't use my book as a text, despite the fact that Dr. Cherry uses it here, and many denominations do. He uses Gordon Kaufman of Harvard, who says that the resurrection appearances are hallucinations. In other words, they went around hallucinating for 40 days. You believe Christianity is based upon hallucinations? Read it. Systematic Theology, Gordon Kaufman, uh, Harvard University. Well, I don't agree with that, despite the fact one of my colleagues prefers that to my book. That's really bad. <laughs> well, now then, why do I talk like this? Why did people like Ponenberg and Moltmann uh, dare, one in Munich, the other one in Tübingen University, to stand up? and put their theological reputation on the line on one great basis, both of them, the resurrection of Jesus Christ being historical. One was the basis of Christology. The other was the basis not only of his eschatology, but of his entire theological system, which is the most powerful theological system coming out of Germany today in my judgment. Jürgen Moltmann. Now then, let's go back, and I'm going to point out why after that night, uh, when I was ambushed, I came to believe this. So strongly. You see, once you put your faith on a line and you're willing to take on six at a time, you finally think out your own faith and ask, what do I really believe? And I did. The next step was dialoguing with Muslims. I shall never forget. I was considered a very honorable man, and they gave a banquet for me in the land of Jordan at the old city of Petra. The mayor of Wadi Musa, the Valley of Moses, says, they call it, uh, gave a real stag banquet. I had to put my wife in the police court because she wasn't welcome. She was a woman. See, my wife usually goes and participates in my theological discussions, but I had to park her with a little Arab named Abraham that night while they had a stag party for me there. And I knew I was an honorable man when I got there. I sat on the right-hand side of the mayor. I knew that meant that I was honored. And then when he gave me one of the eyeballs of the goat, I knew I really was honored. <laughs> and finally, the third act of uh, celebration was to let me have the best part of the liver. And I didn't know that when I sat down there that I was being set up to be converted. 
they had, they had heard of a Baptist from Louisville, Kentucky, named Cassius Clay, being converted to the Muslim religion and adopting the name of Muhammad Ali. So they thought they had another easy Kentuckian on their hands. They found out they didn't. And I'll never forget that night because three of the people present were very learned in the Muslim religion. They'd been invited for that purpose. And here was a mayor with three people very well instructed in the Muslim religion. And they said, do you really believe God had a son? Well, you know, they think, that they, they think the idea that Jesus, Son of God, is some unworthy thing, Mr. and Mrs. God. And I said, I sure do. I believe I'm a son of God. I believe Jesus Christ, Son of God from all eternity, and that he uh, is the Son of God by nature. But I believe because I believe that, that I am a son of God too. Oh, they raved a little while. And then they, another one said, you really believe God let him down on the cross? Well, that was getting to the heart of the matter. I said, I not only believe he let him down on the cross, I think he sent him down on the cross for my sins, and then I made a mistake in a way, and yours. Whew, they blew up. <laughs> I learned very thoroughly. I didn't have to write, I learned it was all in the Quran, that they don't, they don't believe that Jesus even died. They say that night when Judas Iscariot betrayed him, they made a mistake. They arrested I mean, uh, they arrested Judas Iscariot, and they took him out and nailed him on a cross. But Jesus went lickety-split up the Mount of Olives through the olive trees, and that night ascended into heaven. And Jesus didn't get a scratch, so they believe in the ascension of Jesus. Well, that was my beginning to see, oh, I stay around Muslims, I find out what it means to be a Christian. Not so long after that, I took a group of people to Cairo. And it happened that the cousin of Anwar Sadat was our guide. His name was Mohammed Sadat. And so he was going to be our guide. And what a wonderful and articulate man he was. We went to, this, to the mosque where he and Anwar would go on Friday to worship, both of them being devout Muslims. And uh, so we sat down on the floor. They didn't have any pews, of course. Mosques don't have any pews because you kneel so much they get in your way. So uh, we went to it, and he said, sit down on the floor. And then he gave a stem-winding lecture on what the Muslim religion was about. You couldn't ask for anything better. Any questions from any of you? Well, a woman there who had already told me repeatedly that she was a Bible-believing Baptist who had been born again. She had all kinds of bees in her religion. She was a, a Bible-believing Baptist who had been born again. So she threw a question at him and said, What do you believe about Jesus? Oh, he said, We believe Jesus was born of a virgin, that he ascended into heaven, that he's going to come again someday, raise the dead and judge the world, and establish God's kingdom. She nearly lost her upper plate. <laughs> Whew, she didn't expect that. What do you believe about Mohammed? Well, sure, we believe he ascended into heaven there at the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. That's why we want to possess the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, because we believe that's where Mohammed ascended into heaven. But we don't believe Mohammed's going to come again and raise the dead and judge the world. Jesus is going to do that. Oh, she was about ready to pass out. She didn't expect those answers. As we walked out, she nudged me in the ribs and said, Did you hear him? I said, Yeah, listen well. He talks just like a Christian, doesn't he? I said, No, he talks just like a Muslim. She said he believes in the virgin birth and the second coming. I said, That doesn't make you a Christian. She backed off about three feet to look at that professor to see what she had on her hands, looked at me as if to say, What kind of professor are you? She'd already let me know that she was really a Bible believer. I said, you're not a Christian because you believe in the virgin birth and the second coming. To get her off the hook, I said, I believe in both, but that doesn't make me a Christian. And she said, well, will you please tell me what it takes to be a Christian? I said, lady, do you mean you don't know the answer to that question? And I said, did you ever read the words of the Apostle Paul, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so those who have fallen asleep in Jesus God will bring them back with him. And we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that the Lord himself with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we that are alive and remain shall be caught up in clouds of glory to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, she was standing there moving her lips. She knew the passage by memory herself. She said, oh, yes, I forgot about that. I said, lady, don't you ever forget about that because you'll, you've just forgotten what Christianity is based upon. You see the text, if I'd kept on reading a while ago, that if Christ be not risen, we're still in our sins. We are false preachers. 
We don't have anything. We're all people most miserable, you know, as he begins to say, what is true if Jesus, if Christ be not risen? And there she was, right out of the Bible belt of the South, Southern Baptist, who didn't know that the distinctive thing about Christianity was that Jesus died and rose again. Well, I start out because it, it has really sharpened my belief in the resurrection of Jesus by explaining to my Muslim friends. <laughs> they don't corner me anymore in Jerusalem. They can tell you what I'm going to say before they corner me. Because I spent so many, about 20% of my time the last 12 years I've spent in Jerusalem, some of my best friends are Muslims. My wife and I lived just one mile north of Bethlehem for two different years. And we wanted to be balanced so we'd ride in with the Muslims and home with the Jews. <laughs> and a lot of jokes went around about the Moody's are peculiar people. They ride in with the sons of Ishmael and come back with the sons of Isaac. We did it deliberately. My wife is a very sensible person. She suggested that we give no appearance of taking sides, that we were going to love the Muslims and we we're going to love the Jews. Besides, we got to practice Hebrew and, and, and Arabic both in the same day that way. But the people joked about those peculiar people that don't take sides. Now my Muslim and Jewish friends in Jerusalem expect us to do it. The last time I left the airport was in January. A little Muslim was standing over there, and they said, what is he waiting for? I said, I know what he's waiting for. He's waiting for me to come over and say goodbye and give him the holy kiss. Sure enough, and I went over and gave him the holy kiss. I'm good at that. Left cheek, left cheek, right cheek, right cheek. <laughs> went over and gave him a holy kiss. Here was a great big burly Jew, head of the security guard with a submachine gun strapped to his back, uh, guarding us as we got on the plane. And... Uh, all of the people in my group had already gone through. By the way, that holy kissing gets you through customs in about 20 minutes. <laughs> well, so I gave Fadi, the Muslim, a holy kiss, walked over, and it wasn't embarrassing. As a matter of fact, this Jew would have thought a little un... What's wrong with Dr. Moody? He didn't give me the holy kiss. So I went over there, that big old burly Jew from Brooklyn, New York, gave him a holy kiss. Walked through the door and found out that the people who were with me were peeping through the door watching to see what was happening. And a lawyer said, now I know how you get through customs so quickly. <laughs> ah, I said, you may think it's funny, but they expect me to act like that. I am a Christian. They know I am a friend to Bob Lindsay, 35 years pastor of the Baptist Church in Jerusalem. And they've got the idea that we Christians love Muslims and Jews, Arabs, and other people and that we try to be even-handed about it. You see, that's why some Muslims and some Jews decide that our Jesus is worth following. That is why there are so many former Muslims and former Jews, I shouldn't say former Jews, but Jesus Jews in the Jerusalem Baptist Congregation in Jerusalem. I hope the rumor just keeps spreading. You see, there was a good Baptist deacon that practiced that. His name was Jimmy Carter, right? And he loved Manahim Begin, and Begin knew it. He loved Anwar Sadat, and Anwar Sadat did it. And he wasn't just being a politician, he was being a Christian. Anxious to get back tonight to my room to see who won the election today. <laughs> the South's going to rise again. Well, now that's how I came to see in dialogue with Muslims. I wish I'd had the same with Hindus and Buddhists, but that's not my expertise, although next year I will lecture in 12 seminaries in the Far East. But you see, I have learned to state my faith to a Muslim. Hours and hours of dialogue respectfully carried on with all the warmth I can have for them as human beings. January the 17th of this year, before anybody mocks my theology, my Christology, my eschatology, let me tell you what happened on January the 17th. My father, 98, 96 years of age, had a massive coronary. He's doing pretty well now. He said he's going to make it to be 100. Thank God. But anyway, I went, and there he was in St. Paul's Hospital in Dallas, Texas, and one Sunday morning came, and my wife and I are old-fashioned. We go to church somewhere on Sunday morning. Doesn't matter where we are. Even we have to have church ourselves. So I said, let's go down to the First Baptist Church. You all know that tiny little congregation there? 20,000 members. 
voted their budget eight million three hundred thousand the other day. They're going to make it one day financially. <laughs> I went there, and Dr. Crystal spotted me out in the audience. He said, "What you doing here?" I said, "I came down here because I wanted my wife to see." how you act when you're preaching to your own people in your own pulpit because I think you are a pastor who knows how to speak to your own people and I, if you want to know why we're here it's because we love you and we respect you well he said would you like to come up and sit on the platform with me Grady Wilson of the Billy Graham team sat on the right hand but I only got on the left hand side <laughs> so like you know like the apostles on the right hand and the left hand in the kingdom and so sat up there and Sure enough, it was a wonderful service. Grady Wilson actually preached the sermon that morning. He'd been invited to do it. Made the invitation. Here came a tall, handsome man with dark hair down this aisle over here. Dr. Criswell looked up in the pulpit at me, knowing something about my relationship with the Muslim people, said, came up and said, I've got a, I've, I've got a Iranian or something like that up here. You think you would do anything with him? I said, I'll try. So I came down out of the pulpit, knelt down at the altar, asked the man why he was coming forward, told me what his name was, and said he was coming forward because he wanted to become a Christian. Well, I asked the question like this. You believe Jesus died for your sins? Yes, that's why I'm coming forward. I knew immediately he was on his way. That's what I always ask a Muslim if he says he wants to be a Christian. You believe Jesus died. That's number one. You believe he died for your sins. That's number two. Well, when he said that, I said, let's get on our knees. Let's, let's pray. And I prayed the most fervent prayer that I could pray. And uh, I said, now then, if you really want to give your heart to the Lord Jesus, you pray for yourself. I want to tell you, he made my prayer look lukewarm. He began to pray and pray. The tears came down his cheeks. And when he... Got to a certain point, he jumped up and grabbed me and began to give me the holy kiss, and here we were being televised all over Dallas. <laughs> Dr. Crystal, Dr. Crystal already introduced me as a professor in Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and said a lot of nice things, and I don't know what the people in Dallas thought when they looked down there and saw me and that handsome Iranian giving one another a holy kiss. And Dr. Crystal didn't know what was going on himself. He said, what's going on? I said, we just became brothers down here in the front of the church. He's just giving his heart to the Lord Jesus. Well, Dr. Crystal's about like I am. He's effervescent, and he's enthusiastic. He just simply almost went up to the ceiling in the church, got up and told the whole television audience, watching us that Sunday morning, what had happened. Well, this man, Nasser Atari, was his name. He's been baptized in the First Baptist Church of Dallas. He was in the country because he was a top man for the Shah of Iran, who had been sent to the United States to study uh, how to use our sophisticated planes and many other things in our United States Air Force. He had been told to come back to Tehran so they could shoot him. He didn't think that was the best idea he'd ever heard, <laughs> so he decided to stay in Dallas and became disillusioned. As he said to me, I have a hard time believing in a religion that believes you ought to kill people that don't agree with you. And he got to watching TV on Sunday morning, the service in Dallas, and got the idea that the people that he saw on the screen believed in loving people. Got the idea that I grew up on, really. You're supposed to love the church and love the Bible and love God and love everybody. I told Principal Mitten today that's just about the basis of my Christianity. And he got the idea that's what we did. I hope he never learns better. I hope he doesn't meet some Southern Baptist. But I'm sure glad that he at least got that impression. And that's why he became a baptized believer. You see what I'm saying? I think theology ought to be able, you ought to be able to preach your theology. I don't think there's one thing we give in a classroom and another thing we give in the pulpit. That's the way I feel. Some of my students will sometimes say in class, man, that'll preach. Well, when I go out to preach for them, I have to get up a new sermon. I'm glad that they can do that because I hate for a student to go to my class all week and not have anything to preach on Sunday morning. But see, we seem to think sometimes that we're supposed to split hair and get involved in things which don't touch on the lives of people. I gave you that illustration. It was brought to my mind this morning by a question because I want to say this. What I teach in a classroom 
will preach in a pulpit. And anything that will lead a Muslim of the Shiite sect to stand with tears streaming down his cheek and say, I believe not only that Jesus died, but I believe he died for my sins. That, in my opinion, is worth having. And as long as we preach and teach that, I don't think we're going to die spiritually, and I don't think our churches are going to die spiritually. I have to ask for it, but I will. <laughs> now let me tell you another thing. History is to the resurrection. We're just going around. Here were the German Bootmanites. They thought it was all mythology. This is how the water hits the wheel with Muslims. They don't think he died. But what a wonderful thing happened when they come to believe that it was really a historical Jesus. He really died, but the most significant thing is he died for their sins. But the most wonderful thing, I suppose, has happened to me in the last several years was also in Jerusalem. When I went there and met several professors of the Hebrew University who were Orthodox Jews, the most unforgettable one was a pudgy fellow named David Flusser, F-L-U-S-S-E-R. What a wonderful German name he has. It means he flows like a fountain, and he sure does. He's a little old five feet tall and weighs nearly 300 pounds. And when he gets all enthusiastic lecturing, he gets both hands in the air and both feet off the floor. He looks like a blimp floating up in front of his class. <laughs> Well, several years ago in the 60s, he read Rudolf Bultmann's book called Jesus. That's what the German title is, just Jesus. And uh, I listened a half day one time to him as he told why he wrote that book. He said, you know, Bultmann thinks that Jesus was a German. He said he didn't know he was a Jew. And so he decided to write a book with the title, Jesus, you're sure. Published in 1968. People couldn't believe it. The faithfulness with which he expounded the parables, the miracles of Jesus in Galilee. Of course, the real crisis came in his own pilgrimage as he came to discuss those things what, about what happened in Jerusalem. And almost daily, he talked with his dear friend Bob Lindsay that I mentioned a while ago. By the way, that's the closest friend he has. The pastor of the Jerusalem Baptist Congregation for 35 years is the closest friend he has. So they're both brilliant scholars, both in Hebrew and in Greek. And he said to Bob one day, he said, I don't know what I'm going to say about this crucifixion story. He said, there's no problem about Jesus being nailed on a Roman cross because Pontius Pilate and Felix and people like that rejoiced in nailing Jews on crosses. That was their pastime. That wasn't any problem. Certainly Jews, you don't have to tell them that good people, righteous people, uh, get nailed on crosses. Not after six million of them got destroyed in the Hitler regime, you don't have to tell a Jew that righteous people can suffer. You don't have to watch Holocaust to find that out. So you never have a problem with them believing that good people often suffer, just like the book of Job teaches them. question is, what happened to this man Jesus after he got nailed on a Roman cross? Well, he knew quite well that the disciples believed God raised him from the dead. And he decided he was going to get to the bottom of that belief and find out where that belief originated. After all, it's important to know where ideas arise. So Flusser started out, told Bob Lindsay, when I decide why the first disciples believe God raised them from the dead, you'll be the first person that I'll tell. Well, one day he floated in like a blimp and said, Bob, I've made up my mind. He said, I now know why the first disciples believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. He said, I think the first disciples believed that God raised Jesus from the dead because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, I've told that story, and people say, where does he say that? Page 122. Not only says God raised Jesus from the dead, but the disciples saw him resurrected. Oh, that was just his start in 1968 in his famous book, Yeshua, Jesus. Since then... The literature on reconsidering Jesus is enormous. Another Hebrew professor, Pincus Lapid, had written a book, Jews, Israelis, and Jesus, that will really surprise you at how seriously they have studied Jesus. Pincus Lapid himself wrote a book in German called Auferstehung, Resurrection, went something like this. 
In the Old Testament, being an Orthodox Jew, he believed Elijah restored one person to life, Elisha, two people to life, Jesus of Nazareth, three people to life, just like the record says. And then when he was lecturing in the great University of Göttingen uh, two or three years ago, he said, if all that happened, why should we be surprised if God raised Jesus from the dead and that he is still alive? Do you know where they're going when they get that far? If God raised Jesus from the dead and he's still alive, he must be in heaven. And if you're an Orthodox Jew looking for the Messiah to come from heaven, raise the dead and judge the world and establish God's kingdom, you just can't keep a certain question out of your mind. Is it really possible that when Messiah comes, it'll be the return of Jesus? And the moment they say yes, they become what we call Jesus Jews. I taught a Bible class in Jerusalem, 73 and 76, in which half my class was that kind of people. The most vital religious gathering every Saturday morning in Jerusalem is at the Messianic Fellowship on the Prophet Street, where every person practically in that congregation, other people can visit and are very welcome, but they try to be as Jewish as a Jew. And they try to be, as some say, more Christians, more Christian than some of us Christians. That's what's going on in the world today. And that's what I learned from some of my Jewish friends, some of which I can't even mention. See, I believe that we can study the New Testament with the most rigorous historical method. That's what Flusser did. And I heard someone say to him one time when they read that $600 Jewish encyclopedia that's such a wonderful source for a library. If you all want to give me a love gift, that's just a hint. <laughs> Long article in there on Jesus. Long, almost a book in itself. I heard someone say to Flusser, Oh, you got an article in the Jewish Encyclopedia on Jesus? He said, Yeah, didn't you know he was a Jew? A lot of people don't seem to think so. If you read it, you'd think some devout Christian wrote it because of his view that I have just digested. It's an interesting thing. When Orthodox Jews start correcting Protestant theologians and Catholic theologians on their Christology, that's an interesting day to be alive, isn't it? But you see, that's what happens when you start using the historical method instead of a speculative method. When you switch from mythology to history, Well, I haven't gotten to the end of my wonderful dialogues yet. Along with Flusser, one of the friends that will always linger at the center of my heart, very near the center of my heart, is a great man who edited the New Testament part of the Jerusalem Bible in the French language. Many of you know that I'm speaking about that unspeakable scholar almost, great person about as tall as you, and a little heavier. Pierre Benoit. As far as I know, he doesn't own anything but a pair of sandals and a white robe of the Dominican order. One of the most familiar personalities on the streets of old Jerusalem. Everybody loves him. I walked Jerusalem, I think I've touched every cobblestone, walking with Pierre Benoit of the Col Biblique, just outside the Damascus Gate. He and his dear friend, Roland DeVoe, edited the Great Jerusalem Bible in the French language, which is, along with the New Oxford Annotated Bible, the best thing you can, one of the best things you can give to a person to catch up on Bible study. The best Bible study. You professors agree? Good. The rest of you are wrong. Well, I can't tell you the wonderful story. Let me just tell you one, though. See, Benoit just will not rest until he's gotten to the historical foundation of all the things said in the gospel. Read his two volumes on Jesus and the gospels. Two volumes translated in English now. B-E-N-O-I-T, if you are anxious to write the name down and read them. Some of those brilliant essays, plain historical research on many questions that arise in the gospels. And when he finally got them all written in their Review Biblique, which is their publication, they were put in two volumes, I think two of the great volumes on the study of the Gospels of our time. 
Well, he has a very popular tour that he calls In Search of Emmaus. Now, his uh, English, when he's lecturing to English tourists, it's just about half French and half English. And I remember when we got home that night, she said, you know, uh, this was a strange visit. All day long, he said he was looking for a mouse. <laughs> well, she was joking, of course, the woman. He took us to the north where the crusaders thought Emmaus was, and he told uh, how that arose and why he didn't believe it was right. He took us down to Latrune, where the famous Trappist monastery is, to a place called Emmaus, 160 kilometers, 160 stadia from Jerusalem, as the Sinai Bible says, you know. Origin accommodated this, you know. He had a friend named Julius Africanus who started the monastery there, and he wanted that to be Emmaus, so he knew how to do it. He just read, he just took the he just took the Gospel of Luke and put the one word hecaton in and made it 160 stadium. We now know that's what happened. And therefore, uh, Origin of Caesarea accommodated his old friend uh, Julius Africanus, and that's why you have one Bible, one of the greatest Bibles of all, perhaps. One of the two great Bibles, the Vatican Bible and the Sinai Bible. This is the Sinai Bible. It said 160 stadia, but no other manuscript agrees with it, except later ones. Well, we went there, and Ben Wall, of course, he, he <laughs> this was about middle of the afternoon. No, that's not right. So we started back to Jerusalem, and we got to the place that Josephus says is Emmaus. It's exactly 30 stadia from Jerusalem. It's just where if you've been up from the airport to Jerusalem, it's when you just come over the hill from Abu Ghosh and go down the valley, look up on the side of the hill there where the soldiers of Titus made their home after they destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And he gave his long lecture about why he thought that was where Emmaus was. And it was obvious that he really believed the story of the two that went down to Emmaus in Luke 24 as being a historical fact. I said, yes, but Luke says it's 60 stadia. And Josephus says it's 30. He said, yeah, there's some kind of discrepancy there, but I don't know how to explain it, but I do think this is where Emmaus is. I said, uh, do you think that Luke could be thinking about the round trip and that Josephus is talking about the one way? He looked at me and said, why didn't I think of that? Right on the spot, he said, that makes sense. So I made a little contribution myself. There it is, exactly 30th stadia from the temple. I give you that as an example of how we studied historically things. You see, I've come to believe that these appearance stories are real historical. It was my good friend Joachim Jeremias said, when you start reading the appearance stories, start with the Gospel of John. I said, why? He says it's the oldest count of all. It's the oldest account of all. The first one to see Jesus was Mary Magdalene, and the next were the women. And I reason the other Gospels leave it out is because they didn't think anybody would believe the women. Think that one over. So Paul just starts with Cephas, but Cephas number three. So Mary Magdalene said, ben, no, said to Jeremias, Mary Magdalene's number one, the women number two, Cephas number three. The Emmaus story is number four, and number five on the first day of the resurrection was none other than the upper room where the twelve. You've gotten a lot of stories. You have a lot of appearance stories on the first day, haven't you? Now, I'm really going to go out on a limb, and I know I'm going to get some questions about this from some of you, but I believe all the appearances of Jesus were on the first day of the week. We know that the next one was eight days later when Thomas was present. He appeared in the upper room. And that is when Thomas made his great confession, My Lord and my God, I will not believe unless I see the print of the nails in his hands and the slash of the sword in his side. That's the eighth day, isn't it? Well, if you keep going that way, then stay with John. And he says a third appearing took place at Tiberias, near Tiberias, on the Sea of Tiberias, I should say. And there's a whole chapter in John on that. 21st chapter John tells that story of the appearance at the Sea of Tiberias. By the way, that's the only place where it's called the Sea of Tiberias in John's Gospel. And when Pope Paul VI went there, you know where he wanted to go? He wanted to go to Tabga, as they call it today, 
And there is a picture of him now falling, falling on his face because it is known as the chapel of the primacy. Feed my sheep and all that, you know. That's where Pope Paul VI wanted to go. Well, I love to go there with Bible and tourists and lecture on that great chapter with which the Gospel of John closes. I think it's historical. We're told that he gave the great commission on a hill in Galilee, and those who have studied it closely believe it's right up above that place, and that is perhaps the place where he appeared to 500 people all at one time, most of whom were still alive when Paul told the story. At least we know that Matthew's gospel, Mark and Matthew, talk about an appearance in Galilee. And Matthew is the one who tells what happened. The Great Commission was given. Uh, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. And uh, you to go and teach all nations, make disciples of all nations in my name, teaching to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the consummation of the age. You see, those two gospels say that happened there. Well, you've got four Sundays already, haven't you? Haven't you? He's got one more. When did he appear to James? I don't have solid foundation for this, but I would make my guess it was the fifth Sunday that he appeared to James in Jerusalem. He appeared sometime, if you trust Paul, and he appeared to James. When? So what was the sixth Sunday? To all the apostles mentioned by Paul. And that was the day of the ascension. Are you following me what's happening here? Six times seven is 42. Add the Sabbath, and you have 43. If that chronology is correct, if that chronology is correct, every appearance took place on the first day of the week. He ascended on the first day of the week, and Pentecost took place on the first day of the week. What have I done? I haven't left out anything. Now, when this goes on in, my, uh, in our lounge, as Allison Trites knows, some of them smile and say, you just got it worked out too neat. I bow and go to my class. Yeah, if you answered all the questions, you're supposed to be flighty. Okay, there it is. That's what I believe tonight. I believe in the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus and the historicity of every one of the appearances. So, how did I come to that? I've told you tonight. I justified my beliefs to Muslims. I justified my beliefs to liberal Protestants first, to Muslims, to dear Jewish friends who believe what I believe. The greatest one of all is the great Benoit. And I, I hit straight for a cold biblique when I go to Jerusalem and we embrace with a holy kiss. <laughs> And he wants to know what, I can, what he can do to help me. I'm glad I can talk like this. I've got a friend who's a mayor in Jordan. I have a friend who's a cousin of Anwar Sadat, a great friend. He's a friend. I have a Jewish friend who's the most colorful lecturer in the Hebrew University. And he believes most that I believe. All he needs is to be baptized, and I'm waiting to do that. All in the world David Flusser needs is to be baptized. And I think the Lord will accept him, water or no water. What do you do with Jews like that? Believe God raised Jesus from the dead when Messiah comes, it's going to be the turn of Jesus. Say you got all kinds of Lutherans and Calvinists and Baptists who don't believe that. I've forgotten I'm supposed to be lecturing. That's the way I preach. Okay? Why don't we put it on the line and decide whether we're Christians or not? If Christ be not risen, you're still in your sins. And we're found false witness of God because we preach that he raised Jesus from the dead, whom he did not raise up, if it so be that Jesus is not risen. I'll go to a state university and teach philosophy or philosophy of religion. I won't stand in a pulpit and preach Jesus Christ is Lord if God didn't raise him from the dead, I'm an honest man. I mean all that with every fiber in my soul. Why be a religious fraud? If I'm an atheist, I'll be an atheist, but I'll be an honest atheist. If I just have a religious philosophy, and I think I always would have that, 
And tomorrow night I will give you reasons why. I would be a religious philosopher. But I am a Christian. I believe the Old Testament is preparation for my faith. And I believe the New Testament is the beginning of the fulfillment. And the future out there will be the completion of the fulfillment of my faith because God raised Jesus from the dead and he will raise us from the dead. Well, a few years ago, a lot of students in colleges were reading uh, this book, you know, about the Passover plot. Hugh Schoenfield, you know, that's about the only book they ever read about Jesus. They were reading it, thought they knew all about Jesus. So they're going to make a film of it in Jerusalem. Well, the Jesus Jews got all upset. See, they're the ones who believe God raised Jesus from the dead. They got all upset because they were making a movie of the Passover plot by Hugh Schoenfield, who is a liberal Jew. So they went to the great paper, the Jerusalem Post, and said, This is not fair. You spread this all this news in the Jerusalem Post. And he says that when Jesus got nailed on a Roman cross, he threw his body in a dump heap somewhere. He said, You ought to give the other side. So the editor of the Jerusalem Post is an extremely honest person and fair person. He said, okay, what do you want us to do? First thing I knew, a reporter has knocking on my door, wanting to consult me or what about it. He said, what do you believe about it? I told him what I thought about showing for you. <laughs> then I spent a lot of time telling him what I believed. And he said, thank you. We'll put this in the Jerusalem Post. I said, oh, you're going to do more than put what I said in the Jerusalem Post, aren't you? He said, oh, yes. We're going to go over to the Ecole Biblique and see a Catholic now. I said, who is he? Pierre Benoit. I said, I can tell you what he believes before you go over there. He said, oh, what do you mean? He said, that's what, I said, that's one of the dear friends I have. Our beliefs are very much the same. Go on. You're going to the right person. He's the greatest New Testament scholar I know in Jerusalem. I said, but why don't you ask some Jew what he thinks about it? Now, I had a little hidden agenda here. He said, do you mean a Jew? I said, yes. He said, where would I go? I said, go to the Hebrew University and talk to Dr. David Kluser about this. He said, will he talk to me? I said, uh, you don't know him, do you? He said, no. I said, when you talk to him, you will have a hard time keeping him quiet. That night, my phone rang. I'd spent the morning. He went over in the afternoon and talked with Pierre Benoit to Kobe Bleak. Next to uh, that evening, he went over to David Kluser's house and talked with him, called up that night and said, just calling you up to thank you for that wonderful morning we had discussing this issue. And I went over to see Pierre Benoit, and you were exactly right. You, he said almost exactly what you said. I said, I knew what he would say. We have talked about these things by the hours. Well, I said, did you go to the Hebrew University? He said, I just come back from talking to Dr. David Flusser. I said, would he talk to you? He said, I asked him one question, and he talked an hour and a half. Well, you would be surprised to see on the Friday edition, of course, that's like the Sunday edition of our papers, Friday edition, page after page, telling what I said, what Benoit said, and then finally what Flusser said. Do you know the most fervent person on the resurrection of Jesus was not the Southern Baptist, was not the French Dominican, because, but we certainly believed it, but the one who tore Schoenfield apart said he doesn't even understand Judaism, much less Christianity. Christianity is based upon the history of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was amazing. Coming out, and that great paper goes all over the world. There it was. Eloquent as it can be. I put what I had to say tonight mostly in narrative form. But those of you who know the names I've been mentioning knowing, know that I haven't been watching, walking around with theological pygmies. But it makes me feel good all over that I can say, these are my friends. They believe God raised Jesus from the dead. I do too. And I believe that opens up the future, as Moatman says over and over. And the future will be when God will complete his revelation in what he calls the great apocalypse. I believe that. I believe it enough that we can have a good discussion. I hope you believe it.